So before I do the welcome, the virtual welcome, so Dirk, I was watching, actually, why don't you stand up? I don't know if you can stand up with this instrument or not. So how Dirk plays this, tell us how you play this thing. It's amazing. Yeah, this is actually an Irish, what's called an Irish bagpipe, although uh, when they were first being played, they were played all over um, uh, England and Scotland and Ireland, and uh, they're a bellows-blown bagpipe. So you, so you, so you, you pump fill, it with your right. Fill the bag with the bellows instead of, filling the, instead of blowing into the bag directly. And, and, then, and then you squeeze with your left. Squeeze with the left. So, right. so we got a minute. Go for a riff. Go for a riff. Show the okay. <laughs> all right. So, um, so uh, first we start off with the drones. All bagpipes have drones. And then we... I'm going to tune them a little bit. It can be tuned. Most bagpipes don't have the ability to play chords, too. So these do. So, um, so here's our riff. Okay, so very cool. Hey, we, preacher moment. I can have a preacher moment, right? So Chris Lawrence, where's your little drum? Get, go up, get up here, get up here, get up here. Come on, come on. Don't waste time, we're in the middle of church. Come on, clock is ticking. So now, if you're gonna riff, then you can back him up, can't you? Now get ready, because you're next. <laughs> and then you're third, so you're yeah, yeah, so okay. Yeah, okay, here we go. So, so riff, riff, and then you just like jump in whenever like a fiddle thing comes to you, right? You go. Reels, Let's hear this. All out plan. Do you know any reels? Okay, okay. I'll play the same riff. Thank you, you guys. That's awesome. Thank you. We are such a blessed congregation. That was so cool. That is so cool. I've got to wait just for this odd moment till the camera's dialed in. We want to say a huge welcome to all the virtual members of Columbine United Church. Those of you who join us from across the United States, some of you on the other side of the pond, a huge welcome to you. A special welcome to all of our men and women in the military who come to us from literally all over the United States and around the world who kind of keep uh, tabs with Columbine United Church virtually. It is great to have you here. Let's give these people a warm Columbine welcome. Very cool, very cool. Man, that is great music. 
It's just awesome music. So our scripture reading comes to this morning from the book of Exodus, the 24th chapter, verses 18, and then again the 32nd chapter, verses 1 through 6. Listen for God's word as it comes to us today. Moses entered the middle of the cloud and climbed the mountain. Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. When the people realized that Moses was taking forever and coming down off the mountain, they rallied around Aaron and said, Do something! Make gods for us who will lead us. That Moses, the man who got us out of Egypt, who knows what's happened to him? So Aaron told them, Take off the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. They all did it. They removed the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from their hands and cast it in the form of a calf, shaping it with an engraving tool. The people responded with enthusiasm, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from Egypt. Aaron, taking in the situation, built an altar before the calf. Aaron then announced, Tomorrow is a feast day to God. Early the next morning, the people got up and offered whole burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they began to party. Sounds like you guys. It turned into a wild party. And here the, uh, the scripture passage ends, and may God bless these words now as we seek to apply them to our lives. Hey, before I begin, I want, I want to share with you kind of a fun thing. Uh, I'm changing, I'm trying, I'm trying to change the way I preach. I, I had a great, uh, a great moment. A couple months ago, Mitch and I were talking, and, and I call it a Willow Samu moment, because uh, Mitch shared with me a conversation that, she had with, that he had with Willow, that one time when they were driving home, uh, Mitch said, so Willow, what would you think of uh, Pastor Steve's sermon? And, and Willow said, you know, Pastor Steve is just, he's just confusing everything. He just needs to give us one thing. He gives us too many things to think about. And so I kind of walk out of here with nothing. And so I was thinking, oh, out of the mouths of babes, out of the mouths of babes comes some real wisdom. And so I have been working to try to, to shorten it and get it down to one point. I call it my Willow Samu point. And uh, and it literally all week long, when I'm writing, I have Willow right across from me. And I'm writing, and I go, and Willow? And she'll look at me, and she'll go, way too confusing. you got to get it down. And so I'm, I'm working, and I'm finding it to be a huge challenge. So in case I miss it, here's your Willow Samu moment. This is what I want you to walk away from with today. When life is complex, the most important thing you can do is listen. When life is complex, the most important thing you can do to listen is listen. And I want you to think, who do you need to be listening to? Okay? That's your Willow Samuel moment. Tell Willow, thank you. As she's really changing things. All right. When God disappears, when God disappears, has God ever disappeared on you? I'll never forget the first time God disappeared. The first time God disappeared on me. I was about 22, 23. I was a, a, a middler in seminary, my second year in, in seminary. And, you know, seminary is a funny thing. You know, those of us who are, go to seminary, we call it cemetery. Because <laughs> you go there to bury your faith. Because you're just kind of bombarded with all different things and books and concepts and ideas. And, you know, and so you kind of go in there, you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, you know, thinking, thinking, thinking. And, and you're there to become a minister and wahoo, everything is good. And then you start hearing lectures and reading books and, and diving into theology. And your, your faith just kind of gets tore apart and torn apart and torn apart. Until in the middle, of, like in the middle of my seminary, right in the middle of the second year, I, this little theological switch went off in my brain. And I went, eh. There's no God. We made this whole thing up. Freud was right. Marx was right. We made this whole thing up. There is no God. And I tried to fake it for a little while. I tried to fake it when I go to chapel and sing all the hymns and tried to listen to the sermon, but the guy spoke way too long, too many points. He needed Willow Samuel. And I finally realized it all felt stale. That I was making it all up. So I decided to drop out of seminary. I was tired of, of, of being fake and a phony. So I went and got the discharge papers, you know, get out of, out of seminary papers. 
But before I filled them out, I decided to go for a run. I'm a runner. And this is in uh, San Francisco Theological Seminary in San Anselmo, in Marin County. And it's a beautiful run to go down uh, the, uh, the, um, the river and end up at San Francisco Bay. So that's what I did. I was running uh, down along San Francisco Bay. And never forget, I got to this point where there was a fence. And I stopped at the fence. And I was looking out at the bay. And, and I kept on thinking, man, there's no God. There's no God. No God. How could there be no God? God. And I started weeping and crying. There's no God. There's no God. I started shouting it. There's no God. And then I started saying, you liars. My family, you liars. You told me there was a God. The church that I grew up in, you liars. You told me there was a God. My college, I went to a Christian college. You bunch of liars. You told me there's a God. There's no God. There's no God. There's was crying. Ran back. Sat down to fill out those papers. Decided I was going to go paint houses until I could en enroll in, uh, into law school, become an attorney. And before I filled out the papers, I decided to make myself uh, a cup of tea. A cup of tea. A cup of Celestial Seasonings Red Zingers tea. <laughs> Seriously, I still remember. I'm a minister today because of Red Zinger. Wow. Uh, you all, uh, you laugh, it's serious. Uh, you, you all have made celestial seasoning teas, right? You've held the little box, and, and you know that on the, on the side of the box is all these kind of pithy sayings, right? All these kind of cute little sayings. And so while the water was boiling, you know, it's wiping my eyes. I was crying and uh, was reading the, the box. I'll never forget on the box end, what is it saying? What is it saying? Before you can offer someone a glass of water to drink, you must first cross the desert yourself. Well, the God I didn't believe in had whacked me across the head and said, it's okay to be in the desert. I want you to be in the desert. It's okay that you're confused. It's okay that you don't know anymore. It's okay that you don't believe in me. It's okay that, that, that you just have lost it all. It's okay. Especially if you're going to be a minister. Because your whole career is going to be helping people cross the desert. And if you can't figure out how to get something to drink now, how are you going to help anybody else? So I took the papers and tore them up through them. Sat back down, opened the textbooks, and started working. And let me tell you, it was a desert. It was a time of trial. See, you know, and that's what we're looking at um, during the season of Lent, the, the thriving in times of trial. We're, I'm calling it the 40s, because Lent is the 40 days from Ash Wednesday to Easter. And it's 40 days, and there's a significant number for 40 days, because in the Bible, any times it says that, that there was a trial, that there was something that happened for 40 days and 40 nights, it's not that it literally happened for 40 days and 40 nights, but it's symbolic that there was, whoever was in this story was going through a time of real trial. And so for the past several weeks, we've been looking at some of these 40s. I started with Noah and the ark, where it rained and poured for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, last Sunday, Justin talked about where Goliath came out and taunted the tribes, the, 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 um, the armies of Israel for 40 days and 40 nights. And, here, and you heard Justin talked about that that's like you know, when the giants scream at us, the giants in our own lives, and tell us that we're no good. Next week, I'm going to talk about when Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And today, I'm going to talk about when, when Moses and Aaron disappear upon the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Because you know what, that, that was a time of trial. 
That was a time of trial. Because you stop and think about it. That God had, had taken the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt and, and they entered into the Sinai Desert. They're in the desert. And even though they were in the wilderness in the desert, they were not alone because when you pay attention to the story, what the storyteller tells us is that, that God led the people by night through this huge pillar of fire and by day by this huge dust devil. And so God was out in front of them and Moses was right behind that. So everybody knew exactly where they were going. Exactly where they were going. They knew where God was. They knew who was leading them. And while they might not know the desert, they knew where they were going. Kind of the whole life was ordered. And then suddenly, it stops. And God and Moses disappear up in this fog. And they're gone for 40 days and 40 nights. In other words, a very, very long time. So much so that they felt as though that God had disappeared. Moses had disappeared. And if God and Moses had disappeared... Who were they? Where were they supposed to go? How were they supposed to find their way through this wasteland, through this desert? <clears throat> Suddenly all meaning had disappeared. Chaos. Have you ever been there? Chaos. God disappearing, meaning disappearing. What you thought was a very clear path in your life is like, and it's gone. If you've been there, you, you know the pain that the Hebrews felt. You know the pain that I felt. Because it's a crazy pain. It's a crazy pain. See, looking back, I, I realized I made a huge mistake in seminary. I made a huge mistake. It's the same mistake that Hebrews made. It's the same mistake that you make. The, the mistake that I made is that nothing's going to change. I thought I was going to go to seminary and just have everything I knew kind of reinforced instead of anticipating things would change. The Hebrews thought things would never change. God would always be in front of them. Moses would be in front behind God. And we'd, they'd march into the promised land. They didn't anticipate the change. You don't like the change. You don't anticipate the change. You, you want your life to stay the same. We like equilibrium in the middle of our lives. We kind of like the comfort zone. We like the smooth sailing, the easy waters. We hate it when things change. You hate it when things change. Especially when God decides to change. You know, in de facto, people kind of extrapolate from God changing, the church changing. You hate it when the church changes. They change the chairs again. <laughs> again. Why can't things stay the same? And hey, at least God stay the same. See, I, one of the most important lessons I learned in the desert, God is the author of change. God wove it into the fabric of society. Change. Everything about us changes. God changes, we change. The church better change. Change. And that's what brings on the desert, is the, is the change. Now here's the good news. There's only one way to fail the desert test. There's only one way. It's, a, it's, it's so simple. There's only one way to fail this test. And that is when you go for easy answers. When life has become so complex and the changes become overwhelming and the anxiety is so big that you can't stand it anymore and instead of going forward, you go backwards. Mark Foster and I were just talking about this this past week. When the complexity is so frustrating, instead of going into the complexity, you go back. You try to go back. 
You try to have somebody resolve it. See, this is what the Hebrew people did. They couldn't stand the fact that they didn't have a leader anymore. They couldn't stand the fact they couldn't find God anymore. So they went to Aaron, what a schmuck. I mean, he said, make us a God. Yeah. And Aaron says, sure, let's make a God up. Bring us your stuff. So they brought him his gold and jewelry and he melted it down, created a little calf, set it in front of them. There's your God. What a bunch of suckers. Thank God there's a God. And they bow down and start worshiping this thing. Moses comes down and goes, Ay. Yeah, and it's not because they broke the second commandment, because remember, the commandments had not been revealed yet. The whole idol thing, they didn't know anything about the idol thing. They, they, those two guys were figuring it out up there. They didn't know anything about not making it. They failed because they went for the easy answer. That's where the fail was. They wanted somebody to solve their problem. In the middle of your desert, when there's so much anxiety and confusion, you fail when you go, would somebody just figure this out for me? Tell me what to believe. Tell me what to do. Tell me, just tell me, and I'll do it. Well, that's the failure. See, instead, I, what I believe is you need to lean into the complexity. And so for some of you, you look at that and you go, well, that's, that's, that's not complex. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, for me, yeah, that's complex. I can't do that kind of thing. But you see that where we find meaning is when we lean, I call it leaning into the complexity. Instead of falling backwards, you lean into it, you go forward, you start asking questions, you dive into the complexity, knowing that it's okay to be confused. It's okay that things change. It's okay to not know what's going on. So, so it begs the question, where is your complexity? High school kids, junior high kids, where is life confusing? You, you all pay attention back there in that row because I'm going to be talking to you in just a few moments. So hang in there. Adults, where is your complexity? Where is your complexity? Let's, let's think about this. Well, for some of you, you're thinking, oh, well, it's my marriage. Whose idea was this anyway? Getting married. Good Lord. Two human beings living together? Who's cra crazy idea? I mean, stop and think about this. Women. You know what the problem with you women is? Guys, answer this question in your brains. Larry, don't say it out loud. I see you smiling. <laughs> Shh. You're sitting right beside Rebecca. You know what the problem with you women is? You change all the time. Just when, it, right? Just when we think we got them figured out, you change. You change your mind. You're happy one moment. You see an advertisement on TV, you're crying. You cry at anything and everything. What's with the tears? Do you know what the tears do that makes us upset? because we think we gotta fix it, we know we can't fix you, even though we try. Quit changing, women. Quit changing. Guys. <laughs> know what's the problem with you guys? Women, answer the question in your brains. You're deaf. <laughs> That's what my wife always says. You're deaf, you're looking. No, the problem with you guys, you change. All the time you change. You either, you're in your cave or you're out of your cave. And you're in your cave when you're right in front of me. <laughs> and I don't even know you're in your cave. And then you're out of your cave. And you think well, I'm supposed to know when you're in or you're out. You're always changing. Can you just like pick in or out so I know? Quit changing. Teenagers. <laughs> Do you know what's the problem with you teenagers? 
You change all the time from moment to moment. One moment you're happy, the next moment you're Godzilla. Holy cow! How are we supposed to deal with you when you're always changing? And, and how are you supposed to discipline them? Don't you remember the good old days where sending them to your room, go to your room, was a punishment? <laughs> and now sending your kids to your room is like, cool. <laughs> got my computer, got my YouTube, got my music, see you in a month. <laughs> how are you supposed to raise these kids? Quit changing. Just like be something. Don't change. And in the world, those Muslims, they're changing all the time. Can't they get their religion figured out? I mean, what's the matter with them? My gosh, they've got the Shias and the Sunnis and why can't they just like get one religion and like us Presbyterians? <laughs> and like us Methodists and UCCs. Can't they just get like one? Like, you know, us Lutherans and the Baptists and the American Baptists and the Cumberland Presbyterians in the 33,000. But at least we all kind of believe the same. Can't they get it figured out? Muslims quit changing. Oh, it's a complex world. See, we fail. <laughs> we fail when we go to the easy answer. Oh, women are. Men are jerks. Teenagers are disrespectful. Muslims create terrorism. And Jesus goes, oh. See, in instead, here's your Willow Samuel moment. When it's complex, the easy answer is falling back. The divine is when you go forward into the complexity and you listen. Instead of talking, you sit down with the significant somebody in your life. And you say, okay, obviously we're not on the same pitch. So I'm going to sit here and I'm going to shut up. You talk to me. I'm just going to listen. You sit down with your teenager. All right, obviously we're not on the same planet. So instead of me telling you what you need to be, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to my teenager. Teenagers, same deal. Well, your parents, instead of rolling your eyes at your parents, after they and they take a breath, go, stop. I want to listen to you about you. Because obviously I'm doing something that's frustrating you, and so I need to hear that. Listen. Something you don't understand, like in the world, like, like I, all week long, I hear a lot about Islam. So instead of thinking, hmm, maybe it's not Islam, maybe it's in the Middle East, and maybe there's some issues for some folks and they're using the religion to drive their political agenda has nothing to do with this great, great faith. See, that, that takes listening. That takes listening. It takes listening. I think it's the same with our relationship with God. You know, for me, go back to seminary, is a... Is, uh, Crossing the desert is a drag. Because you don't know if you're going in the right direction. You don't know if you're asking the right questions, let alone finding the answers. I kid you not, this is a true conversation I had with a guy that lived next door to me. He, I, he came to me and he said, what's with you? He said, you're in the library every single night until the lights go out. 
You read more books than the rest of us. You write more papers than the professors require. What's, what's your problem? Are you trying to brown nose your way in? I said, <laughs> no. I'm trying to figure it out. And, and I, every day is another challenge to not drop out of seminary. Every day is another challenge to try to figure out what I believe. And here's the cool thing. What I discovered is that you don't have to get on the other side of the desert to find God. No, what, what I found is that God is in the middle of the desert. And what I found is that, that God didn't change. I was changing. And my change was good. God wanted me to change. When your spouse changes, that's good. We want our spouses to change. When our kids change, that's good. When our world changes, that's good. It's how God created it. The challenge is to listen. In the middle of the craziness, to listen. And so my, my invitation to you is very simple. Who do you need to listen to? Let's pray. Oh, loving God, it's springtime, yay! Sunshine, warm air, the world is changing. Ha. Everything about it is change. Our lives change. And the change upsets us because we, we want things to stay the, stay the same, but we know they can't. And so we ask that you give us the courage to keep on changing, to be resilient, and to bite our tongues. And instead of like sh talking louder and shouting and demanding that we be heard, and you give us the courage to be quiet and to listen. Help us to listen to our, our loved ones, our kids, our coworkers, our neighbors. Help us to listen. And most importantly, to listen to you. That's what your son tried to teach us when he taught us this prayer. And it's a prayer that while we say it to you, it's really about an invitation to us to listen. So God... May you speak to us as we say the prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.